Welcome to Paired Texts for Elementary Steamers with Deborah Ford Sawyer. Some of you may have known Deborah way back when she was the district librarian for San Diego Unified. She is currently the California Implementation and Training Specialist for the state-funded K-12 digital project for teaching books. So she's been traveling a lot. Some of you may know how much she goes around doing her presentations, but she always comes home to California from Ohio to work with us. So thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Miss Ellie. Oh, just lay, you can lay it right there on that table and then I'll come back. We're gonna start with um, a poll. I learned something yesterday and so I'm gonna teach it to you today. Um, so I heard this from Renee Hobbs yesterday. It's a uh, website called Slido. And so you're gonna use your device and go to slido.com. Here it comes. And we're gonna take a live poll. Tick tock, tick tock. And so you're gonna go to slido.com and when it asks you for the um, event number, you're gonna say P045 and answer this question. Uh, P045. And you're gonna answer this question. It's also on the screen. I use nonfiction in my program every day, once a week, sometimes or rarely. Answer the Choose the response that most fits your style. And let's just see. Answers are coming in right now. Every day is in the lead. Thankfully, no one has said rarely yet. So this is a little poll thing, and you can, um, you can do three questions per event. I haven't hit my ceiling yet. I'm sure it's a, it's a paid product, but you can get an educator um, account. It's slido.com, but it's a great thing to do um, before you teach a lesson, so you find out what kids know about such and such a thing. So maybe um, you, can do, you can do all kinds of questions. They can be open-ended. You can do a word cloud, like for example, um, when I say the word frogs, what do you think of? And then you could do a word cloud and kids would type in the words they think of when you say the word frogs and you'll get a little idea of where their mindset is before they get started. And so it looks like 40% of us <clears throat> use nonfiction in your program every day and certainly it gets circulated in your library every day. Um, but let's jump right in there and learn a little bit about not only nonfiction, but also fiction. Again, I'm Deborah Ford Salyer. I'm your implementation specialist for teaching books, going from one end of California to the other to say, you get a resource and you get a resource and you get a resource. And so we're gonna talk about how that resource supports what you're doing with STEAM in the next hour. Um, you can um, contact me at deb at teachingbooks.net and you can follow me on social media at LIB Deborah Ford, Deborah the Long Way. Aunt Betty would say she's not an undergarment. Deborah the Long Way. So the first thing I need to make sure that you know is that the resources that I'm gonna be talking about today that support these texts are all at teachingbooks.net slash California. Um, so raise your hand if you're already using teachingbooks.net at California. Awesome, almost everybody in this room. Yay! Um, so you have access through um, the state K-12 digital project and all you have to do to access teaching books uh, is go to teachingbooks.net slash California and enter your educator login and that's your work email. If you've never done it before, it's gonna ask you to create a profile and you fill that out. You'll have to uh, verify it with a confirmation code via your email and then you'll be in and you'll see your name um, in your account. 
Um, and you also know, uh, of course, I hope, that you, if you're a public school or a charter school, you also got Britannica English and Britannica Escolar, and you also got seven products of ProQuest. And if you're an independent school, you also got <coughs> <coughs> teaching books and Britannica, but not ProQuest. I have water, thank you, Ellen. So, let's jump right in there. So STEAM is, of course, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. <clears throat> and we can connect all those dots in the library. So the first dot I want to get to is engineering. One of my favorite new books from 2019 is called King of the Tightrope. And it's the story of when the great Blondin threw a rope across the Niagara Falls and walked on it. And so Don Donna Janelle Bowman, who wrote this picture book for older readers, she thought to herself, why? Why would he do that? And so this is the story of how he grew up as a young boy and tried to, um, his family was a part of a circus and they walked the high ropes. And so when he came to the, uh, he came to Niagara Falls, he uh, <clears throat> got all excited and thought this is the perfect place to do it. Now you can pair this book with another nonfiction book called Crossing Niagara by Matt Tavares, which is the story of the Adventures of the Great Blondin. And so one thing you might do is just do nonfiction versus nonfiction and read one of the nonfiction stories and then read the next one and talk to your kids about what did you see, what is different, what is the same. Now if I go into teaching books and I type in um, King of the Tightrope, I can just type it in my big box and right away it comes up. One of the cool things that you'll find there uh, <clears throat> aside from the original resources, or you'll find the author's website. And when you go to Donna's website, you'll find that she has a whole lesson of stuff that you can use in your classroom or in your library about the Great Blondin, including this teacher's guide. And in this teacher's guide, you will see questions that you could use it in your classroom. There's vocabulary. Now, one thing you might think about is some people may not have any idea why it's just amazing that somebody would think to do that. How many of your children have been to Niagara Falls? Maybe not. Of course your children have been to Niagara Falls. Some of you I know. Uh, but what she does in her lesson um, activity guide is she gives you a map of Niagara Falls so kids can see where it is. So we're connecting geography in there. There's a, a link to Niagara Falls facts. There's a video so they can see it. And then there's French vocabulary because Grandin was French. And so you can learn how to say those words before you read the book out loud. There are all kinds of activities in there. There are other resources, uh, like how do you use a sextant, because he used scientific equipment to decide where to put the rope. How, do, how many guidelines did he need? How thick was the rope supposed to be? Um, and then, wait for it, it's a reader's theater script. So there are five narrators plus Blondin, and so you can divide your kids up and do a reader's theater script in the library or in the classroom and go over what happened in the story. And all of that is on her website, which we got to from, the, um, from her website at Teaching Books. But because Teaching Books also looks for lesson plans, you can just click on the lesson plans activity, Teacher's Guide, and there it is. It's the same thing. <clears throat> now recently she did a blog post, and on the blog post she showed her foot as compared to the um, the size of the rope, which is just uh, scary just to think, you know, to put yourself on that rope. Um, but you can also look up Crossing Niagara and you'll find resources for that one too. Uh, robots, of course, is another aspect of STEAM. And so you could pair wild robots inspired by real animals. So look at this picture of this book. You can see the head of the snake is connected to a robot body. And so this is a, a, a nonfiction book about how they have real animals, but they use real animals to inspire the creation of these robots. And then you could pair that with this new fiction book called Cog, which is the story of a boy who looks exactly like a real boy, kind of a Pinocchio sort of story, but he's a robot. 
and he has been built to learn things. And so if he knocks over a glass of water, he realizes, whoops, that's probably not a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't do that. And one day he thinks, what happens if I walk in front of this big truck? What do you think happens, boys and girls? It's a bad thing for a machine to be hit by a truck and for a person to be hit by a truck. And so when he wakes up, he's on an operating table strapped down in a scientific lab where some crazy scientist has decided, I'm going to remove your brain so I can create my own army of cog robots who can take over. And he decides that is not a good thing. I've got to get out of here and I've got to find Gina who invented me. And so with the help of some really unlikely other robotic creatures, off they go to try to find Gina and stop this madness. Um, so good for fans of the wild robot. The ocean. Um, <clears throat> the ocean, um, there's a new book from 2019 um, written by Melissa Stewart and illustrated by Sarah Brannon that shows that seashells are more just the thing that you collect on the beach. All the different things that seashells do. It answered for me that at all the things I can see. You know? But in this book, I learned that it uses that So beautiful. Now, this morning we, we heard, if you were in the opening session, that showing a video is great, but there needs to be some sort of interaction and follow-up, right? Um, so take a second, turn to your neighbor. What do you think about that video? What, what was in the mind of the marketing team who put this trailer together? What was their purpose? What does it do for you? I'll give you a, um, just a few seconds to talk about it, and then... We'll share and we'll move on. So, one of the things that, that I want to remind you that it's important to do when you're working with STEAM, when you're working with science, the whole point of science is to ask questions. 
and that the questions are constantly changing. The answers are constantly changing. They're all kind of things that we know. That's why we know Pluto's no longer a planet. If we never thought about Pluto again, you know, that would be the end of it. But people continue to look. Science continues to ask questions. And so asking questions, have them turn to their neighbor. And even in a short library period, because this is an elementary group, and I know many of you are back to back to back to back, and you're trying to check books in and out, but squeeze in a little bit of content while you're at it. And so one way you can do that is just to have kids to turn to their neighbor. Everybody gets to talk. Everybody gets to share. And you don't have to recap it, or you can. You know, if you have some time and you want to say somebody want to share out for the good of the group, or um, you might call on some people, but it's another good way to um, help them think about why did that impact you and how did it make you feel and why do you suppose they did it that way? Asking those questions. You can also use fiction groups, and so I found three books from 2019 that all have something to do with weather. So there's The Phone Booth and Mr. Hirota's Garden, which is actually a picture book about a tsunami. And then there's Hurricane Season, uh, which actually is an, a book with an LGBTQ focus, where it's about a dad who has some sort of mental depression, and he's a writer, and he's kind of off the rails a little bit, but every time there's a hurricane, he wanders himself off to the ocean and his daughter is kind of the parent in this story but somewhere along the line the person who rescues him is the man who lives across the street and so there is a new parent in this story and then the Stormkeepers island which is a fantasy story it's the first in a series by katherine dole um, debut author where a boy has to become a, a hero whether he wants to or not it's in his family his grandfather is the storm keeper and he keeps all the stories in these candles and he comes to the island where something uh, evil is underneath the earth and he can feel it in his feet and he's got to step up to the plate so to speak so a good um, especially for kids who like adventure it's another way to sneak a little science in there at the same time and then there were two books, there were actually several books about birds last year. Um, <clears throat> birds of a Feather is a story called, um, subtitled Bower, Birds, and Me, written by Susan Roth, and it was genius. It told, it compared Susan as a writer and a creator of collage picture book illustration to what a bower bird does to build this bower to catch its mate. And so at the end of the story, it talks about I, how we're the same. I'm catching a reader, and you're catching your mate. And then there were several books with birds and bird nests. So this one, Not Your Nest, by Gideon Starer, and illustrated by Andrea Sarumi. And I should check teaching books, I know, to make sure I said that right. Um, but Not Your Nest, what do you see is unusual about the cover of this picture book? There's a zebra in a nest. And so this is a story about a little bird that is building his nest on an African safari, and every time he gets finished, some big, al big animal is sitting in it. <laughs> and he says, excuse me, that's not your nest. And they say, well, you can just build another one. And so it's also a story about kindness and a story about, oh, we should not be so selfish. And so um, at the end of the story, uh, there is room for everyone. So a good, funny story that also talks about birds. Here are two more. On the left side, there's Fly by Mark Teague. And it's a wordless book, but it's like a graphic novel because it has captions. And in the captions are pictures. And it's a story about a little bird does not want to fly. He wants his mom to bring him the food. And when you look at the illustrations, you can see that mom is saying, you just get your little self by that nest because I'm not going to just feed you forever. And so then he pitches a good old hissy fit and flies him, his little self out of the net onto the ground. And now he's got a problem. How am I going to get back up there? How will he solve that problem? You'll have to find the book and read it yourself. Superlative birds is poetry and science. These are all birds, the most this, the worst that, the best this. Um, it tells the story of some Quielas, who live in Africa, and they only travel in this tremendous mass. And even though they weigh less than a pound each, because they, are, they travel in such large flocks that when they sit on the boobab trees at night to rest, 
Sometimes they break the trees. Can you imagine? You're a lion going to sleep under the tree, and all of a sudden, not only do you have bird poop on you, you have a whole flock just break in the tree right on your head. Uh, so it has amazing facts. You tell some of the stories, like the bird that um, catches insects, but because his beak is so teeny tiny, he can't chew them. And so he stabs it on a piece of barbed wire or a thorn until it rots, so that it's gooey enough for him to eat it. Yep. You tell stories like that, you'll never see the books again. They just go from kid to kid to kid. Some people still tell me that one of the facts they learned from me is about wombats. Yeah, square, poop. square poop, see? We don't forget these amazing scientific things. Um, here we have a pair of polar bear book, uh, books. We have The Polar Bear by Jenny Desmond, and we have Le Lindsay Moore, uh, Sea Bear, which is a story about survival. And so it sort of focuses more, Sea Bear is actually fictional, and it focuses on um, global warming, told in the voice of a polar bear, beautiful blues, beautiful illustrations. And so one thing you might do, um, in addition to comparing the stories, is look at a fiction book. And what are the, in this fiction story is true? And how can we prove that? Worms. I can only draw worms. You'll have to go, we don't have time in this short little session, but you'll have to go online and look for the video trailer of Worms, I Can Only Draw Worms by Will Mabbitt, because he can only draw worms, literally. There are only worms on the page. Here's worm number one. Here's worm number two. I can hardly tell them apart. Here's worm number three. I'll make him a different color. Why? Because I lost my pen. So it's hilarious, and you don't learn really anything about worms. It's counting, so it's a math book, which also makes it good for STEM. And then you might pair it with Carl and the Meaning of Life. And in Carl the Meaning of Life, Carl is also an earthworm, and he doesn't understand what's my job, what's my purpose in life. The fox knows what he's supposed to do. The squirrel knows he, what he's supposed to do. The, the rabbits know what they're supposed to do. What is my meaning? What is my... And so he decides to go off and find out. And when he does, there's nobody taking care of the earth. And so plants can't grow in the hard earth, et cetera, et cetera. And so he comes back and he realizes his point in the whole circle of life. Now, one thing you might do with these is there's a really great resource called wonderopolis.org. Some of you, I've told this to you before. And there is an article in there called, um, Why Are Worms Good for Your Garden? It's a free website, and it has informational text. It can be listened to. It has vocabulary. It has a test. It has external resources. So it's a good third piece to put to it. Um, then there is Worms for Breakfast, which is a nonfiction book on how to feed a zoo with recipes. Don't eat these at home, because some of them are like gross pops. You know, they're just things that a seal will eat and things like that. But it, they went all around the, the author and the illustrator. They talk to people at zoos all over the world and uh, talk about how they feed those animals. And so who even knew that was a job? You can be a cook for the zoo. How about that? Um, oh, so here's Wonderopolis. This is what I was telling you earlier. And when you go there, you can search for all kinds of wonders. So this one, it gives you pictures, it gives you a little short video, and it gives you three starter questions. So you, as the elementary librarian, you could put this on your screen as kids come into the library and they have to answer these questions in their partners, in their groups, or by themselves before they can go looking for their book. And then by that time you've checked all your books in, they get their book, and then this lesson is your lesson. Um, and then you have all these extension activities that you can use too, and it is free. And you can look for more resources um, on pretty much any subject. Dragons and dinosaurs. You can never have enough of those in elementary. And so this year there's a new one called Titanosaur. And the Titanosaur is 120 feet long. And, <coughs> excuse me, two um, paleontologists wrote this story 
It's an oversized picture book, and you might pair it with Dragon Knight, which is a story about a little boy who's afraid of the night, N-I-G-H-T, and a dragon who's afraid of the K-N-I-G-H-T. And it's a story where the two of them become friends, and they are trying to not be afraid of the two things that they're afraid of, but um, as they've formed this friendship, daylight comes, and now the dragon will be seen. And so what can George do to hide his dragon from the daytime? So one thing you might do with this is have a maker space. It is a picture book, yep. Dragon Knight is a, these are both picture books actually. One is a nonfiction picture book and the other is a fiction picture book. Um, you could use books like this in pairs in your makerspace. So always think if you have a makerspace, what books could I put to inspire my kids to create, to think, to draw, to make? And so your activity for this book could be, how can George hide the dragon in the daytime? Draw your plan and create a list of supplies. So some of you have uh, funding issues. Maybe you don't have stuff where they could make something, a device, a machine, a something. And so instead, they could be architects. They can be drawers. They can think. They can be the think tank. Um, and they could just draw. This could also be an activity. Some of you have kids who can't be still. It's not their fault. And so we don't want to become that mean dragon library person by making them be quiet all the time. So you could put those kids at the back of the room or at the back of the group or have everybody at the table and give them that paper and pencil and while they're listening to the story, they can draw what they're thinking. Um, it keeps them busy, it keeps them focused, it keeps them engaged and they don't distract those kids who need silence when you're reading. Um, here's one on a similar subject called Whales. Uh, Song for a Whale is a debut novel by Lynn Kelly. It also uh, won several awards. It's about a girl who can't hear. And she learns about a whale who can't sing with, uh, to other whales. He can't hear the other whales communicating. And for years he's been floating around in the, swimming around in the ocean all by himself. And so she uses her technology to write a song and she and her grandmother go on a crazy escape on a wild trip to go and play that song for the whale so that he can finally communicate with his people. You might pair that with this um, Jessica Lennon's book, The Fisherman and the Whale, which is a picture book, wordless story about a whale who gets caught up in the fishing tank, uh, fishing gear, the ropes and the traps and all those kind of things, and the fisherman has to set it free. Or these two books, which are fairly recent, these are nonfiction books, The Blue Whale by Jenny Desmond, same author of the polar bear book, which we looked at earlier. Beautiful book that also talks about how big it is. Um, and then Beyond Words, What Elephants and Whales Think and Feel. Because some of these books um, that we're doing, these picture books, will lead kids to longer books. But you know that for elementary, even nonfiction continues to be 48 pages and less. It's just the way the publishing field is working. Maybe 96, but once they get to 96 pages, they tend to be, um, more focus for upper elementary, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And so you'll have to decide if they're suitable for your kids. Space was huge in 2019. There is the Just Right, Searching for the Goldilocks Planet, which was a picture book. And then Jeff Rodkey published a book called We're Not From Here about life post Earth. We have made a mess of Earth. And now we live on a space station, but we've run out of food. We're running out of water. We're running out of medicine. We've got to find another place to live. So they discover in another solar system a place that will accept the, 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 earth, the earthlings, the humans, to come be aliens to their planet. And so, but the only way they can get there is if they freeze themselves and wake themselves up 20 years later. And so they get there, and then they've had a change of politics, and now they're no longer welcome. Now they've used up all their fuel to get there. What will they do? And it's hilarious. And it has a blue cover. And so surprise, at the end, you're going to need some tissues um, because it has one of those Disney movie endings where you're crying, clapping, all at the same time. 
um, the astronaut who painted the moon, the story of Alan Bean. After Alan came back from his moon expeditions, he began to paint his pictures that were taken on the moon. And so this is a picture book biography about him. And then there is Pluto gets the call. This is the call where the day uh, Pluto got the call, hello, you're not a planet anymore, I'm so sorry to be the one to tell you. So of course it is what kind of book? It is a fiction book. Pluto could, Pluto could not actually take the call, but, um, but um, it's a funny uh, science book uh, illustrated by the power team of Adam Rex and Laurie Keller. Now at this point, we're about halfway through, and you are prob some of you are writing furiously and wishing you had a list, right? So I have given you a handout and I'll be posting it on the CSLA website. And on that handout, you see a QR code. So who brought your phone with you? We're about to have a magical moment. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is take that QR code and lay it on your table. And then you're gonna take out your iPhone or your QR reader, and you're gonna hold it over that QR code and a little window at the top is gonna pop up, it says website QR code, and you tap that and open it and what you will get is this list of books that I put together for you, paired text for elementary steamers. 40 books with almost 400 resources to help you share these books with your kids and your teachers. This is the part where you clap. You're welcome. You're welcome. So did you see how that happened? Did everybody get it? Now, here's the tricky part. You can, at this point, you want to keep your list, right? So you see at the top, it says duplicate list. So you want to tap duplicate list, and then I get this message to create a list, are you an educator or adult? You say educator, and then it's going to ask you to log in. And that's the part where you put in your email for your Teaching Books account, which we're not going to take time to do right now but that's what you would do. And when you get that far and put yourself in there, it's going to, um, it will save your account, save that list of your account, and you just wanna make sure you say save. And once you do that, then you have that list in your account and you can edit it, share it, however you want to. Another way you can do that is you see underneath that code, it says teachingbooks.net slash QLADK52. You could literally also type that in to a, an, a, a URL address box and it will pull up that list the same way. So you could, if you're following along on your laptop and you want to just add it right in, you can use that list too. The beauty of that is that's one of those share tools from Teacher Books. And anybody who gets this scan code or gets that, we call that a permalink they immediately have access to the, whatever that goes to. They don't have to know about the K-12 project. They don't have to have a login. They just get it. Um, so let's look at some more things that are in that list. So a couple more books about space. One is about Katherine Johnson. It's called Counting the Stars, beautifully illustrated by Raul Colon. It's a picture book biography about the importance of math and um, Katherine Johnson and her work as a NASA mathematician. And then there's Venetia Burney, who was a little girl who named Pluto. One day she's at breakfast with her grandfather and they're talking about the discovery of this new planet that they heard about in the United States, but the scientists don't know what to call it. And she'd been studying Roman mythology at school and she knew Pluto was a far out, cold, dark, nobody cares about me planet. And she decided, oh, that's kind of like Pluto. Let's, they should call it Pluto. So grandpa writes a letter to the scientists he knows in England and they write to the scientists in the United States. They take a vote and 100% say yes. So it's named by a little girl. And this is that story. Or snakes. Snakes is always a good subject because kids love snakes, uh, especially in elementary school. So there is a book of poetry called Predator and Prey where um, we have poems on both sides of the coin, those that eat and those that are eaten. Um, and then there are snakes on the train, which is a fiction picture book, so cute. These little snakes are on the train and this is their journey and there's a new one, snakes, I forget what it's called, but snakes on a something. 
I'm in a room full of librarians. Somebody will look it up and tell me, I'm sure. I hope it's not. I am hope it's not snakes on a plane, but it could be. Um, dogs. Dogs is another um, subject that we can study in science. Um, good Dog McTavish, it, for fans of Patricia McLaughlin, this is Meg Rosoff, and it's written in the voice of the dog, and the dog is a, a rescue dog, and the family has come to the rescue kennel, and the dog sees these people, and he thinks, oh, I don't want to do it, but I have to. These people need saving. They are a mess. And so he decides, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll take you. And so he goes home with the McTavish family. And then chapter two, we find out that mom has quit. You people don't appreciate me. I will not be the mom anymore. And so this is McTavish's job to get the family back in shape so mom will want to come back and do her thing. And then on the, um, another fiction book, but this is a chap, I mean a picture book, is Good Boy. Now, what commands do you give a dog? Good job. What else? Sit. Stay, roll over. You've already read this book. That's the first three commands. Sit, stay, roll over. Uh, but then they get to things like clean. And you see the dog with a broom and a dustpan. And off they go onto a little journey. So it's an adventure story as well. So a little fantasy. Snakes on the job. Snakes on the job. Thank you, Miss Patty. So here we have um, our next book about dogs. It has a Meet the Author recording. So I want you to make sure that you know about that. So at Teaching Books, one of the things that we do is not only curate uh, good information and good resources for you to share these books, but we also talk to authors every day, we record their names, um, we find audio excerpts so you can hear how the story sounds, um, but we also talk to them and find out why did you write this book? And so I'm gonna play a little bit um, by husband and wife team, um, Patrick and Jessica, who wrote this story. My name is Patrick Down. And my name is Jessica Kensky. And we're the authors of Rescue and Jessica, Life-Changing Friendship. We also happen to be husband and wife, and our book is based off of our real-life experiences. We were both critically injured in the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, and we were newlyweds that were spectating at the finish line. One of the things that we had to navigate very early on among a whole bunch of physical and emotional injuries and issues was being out in public again, and uh, in particular, being around children, whether it be at the grocery store, in an elevator, in a parking garage, and kids were quite shocked to see us early on without prosthetics on and wheelchairs and crutches and as we moved through our recovery, we had various equipment and prosthetics, and then we eventually added our big, beautiful service dog rescue. We were being stared at sometimes by children, and their parents or the adults with them, you could tell, didn't really know what to do or say, and would kind of rush them along. And I think Patrick and I started to try to figure out a way to better interact with the kids in public. and have us not be something to look away from, but to turn towards. And I think rescue in public really became a opening point for people to meeting us and talking to us. And the book, I just feel like, was our way to do it on a much larger scale. You know, we just realized the need for it and that kids were staring because they were just trying to make sense. of. What so that's just a piece of that Meet the Author reading, which is only five minutes. And so you could play this before you read the story or after you read the story. You have to decide how you want to do it. And just remember that everything can be translated into multiple languages. So if your children read Arabic, they can listen to her in English, but then they can read it in Arabic. But a great way to maybe even send it home. So wherever on Teaching Books you see that little share, let me turn it back to English. You see this little red arrow, you can share that page. And you can send an email or you can make the QR flyer like I did. You can create a bookmark or put it in the book. Um, <clears throat> you can add it to Google Classroom, all those things, and they don't have to know anything about it. So that's a little bit about Rescue and Jessica, which won Schneider Family Award. Um, and then there's art. Art is also part of STEAM. So there, of course, you can always use picture books and talk about the art in them. Um, maybe focus on the Caldecott Awards so that kids learn that's the difference between watercolor and computer-generated 
and acrylic and collage and all those different kinds of ways. But you can also pair art books with um, informational text that's been vetted. For example, um, Two Brothers, Four Hands is the story of the artists Alberto and Diego Giacometti. And you probably recognize this skinny metal guy sculpture on the cover, right? You recognize him. Um, but watch what happens on my computer when I do a search for Giacometti sculptures. I'm going to do a Google search just like my kids would. Giacometti sculptures. But watch what happened. Those of you in the room, you can see that all of a sudden on the right hand side I got Britannica, which as you know, you got in the state of California. And so what happens is, I just click right here, it takes me right into the Britannica article, and I can look at images, I can read more about Geocometti. All of that information can be cited, and I can get even more information by looking at the websites. And these websites are going to be vetted for our kids, not just wandering around in the Google wilderness. Now, how did I get that? Are you asking yourself? So what I did was I went into Google and I put, um, I went to the Chrome store, Chrome extension store, it's a Chrome extension, and there I searched for Britannica School. Britannica School, and there's an extension, and I've already added it, so mine says add it, but over here on the right it will say add it, and when you add it, when you do a Google search, it will put the Britannica shortcut right there. So whatever you're searching, if there's anything on Britannica, so it's a great way to get them to concrete information instead of just Googling it around. Yep. It, it doesn't take Wikipedia out, it pushes it further down the page. And you might have noticed that on my screen, when I did that search, there was a big black bar at the top. Did you notice that? Um, I'll do it again. Dogs. So you see this big black bar? This is Destiny. There's also a Chrome extension for those of you who use Destiny. And you connect it to your catalog. You just say, this is my school. And so when kids do a Google search, it will pull up your Destiny catalog. And so if I want to just go there, it again pushes everything further down the page. And then I click there and it takes me right into Destiny and I can get to my books about my subject I just looked up, my databases, the websites, and the whole nine yards. And you find it the same way. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> another um, one you could pair it with is Brave Ballerina. And then you can look up um, Janet Collins in Britannica because um, Janet Collins was a, um, American ballet dancer. Um, she um, was the first, I want to say, that's right, um, black ballerina. And she also has an article in Britannica, so you can look her up. And then there's water. Water is another great um, part of STEAM. Um, Annette, Antoinette Portis writes a story about Hay Water, um, which is another award-winning book. It's interesting because Annette lives in the desert. But she got inspired by looking at her little girl playing in one of those little wading pools. Um, you might pair it with the fiction book Noodle Heads, Get Find Something Fishy. It's a graphic novel for beginning readers um, of, what do you call those stories? Those Juan Bobo stories where they're not very smart. They're noodle heads, literally there's nothing in their head. Um, and so they are going to go fishing in this story, but they don't know anything about fishing, and so they get advice from the fish. Um, so it doesn't quite go very well. They don't catch many fish. Buildings. Um, back to our engineering and our technology. Um, there is a new book, a picture book called Skyscraper, and it shows the building of a skyscraper, and it goes into all kinds of um, equipment that it takes to build a skyscraper. And then there's school's first day of school, which is about the building of a school, and it's told in the viewpoint of a school. Math. This year, I went to the math conference. It was so fun. 
we have to converge all of us onto the math conference. Um, I heard that in the math conference, Southern Conference, there are 8,000 math teachers. What a great way to promote you and your resources to go present at the math conference. Um, so I went and I talked about math books. There are over 1,300 math books and teaching books. Um, and here is one, Animals by the Numbers, and full of animal infographics that you could go back to your databases and digital resources and look and prove that stuff. Or the Miscalculations of Lightning Girl, which is a chapter book about a girl who gets struck by lightning, and now she can do amazing math in her head. Oh, if that were the only results from being struck by lightning. Now, on your handout, um, you will see underlinings for resources. That's because these are awards that will help you find more books like these that I'm talking about. So first of all, there's the Eureka Award, which is nonfiction chosen by the California Reading Association. You should know, pat yourself on the hat, on the head, on the back. Um, California is the only association, the only state that has um, a nonfiction award. It's also the only state that has a picture book for older readers category in their Reader's Choice Awards, the only one. Um, but then there are other awards um, for STEAM, like the Green Earth, or there's Best STEM Books. There's a math award called Mathical. So all great math books. Um, there's the Outstanding Science Trade Books. I spoke one time at the um, National Science Teachers Association, I spoke twice, um, <clears throat> about the Outstanding Trade Books for Science Teachers. I got rushed at the stage. Rushed, I mean literally I was afraid, because they, a minute I was over, it was like, <laughs> Where can we get these books? Don't forget your science teachers. They need good content and you have that stuff. So don't forget about them. Um, and then there is actually a STEAM collection at Teaching Books. So you just actually go to that search box and you type in STEAM and don't hit enter. And you will see in the right hand corner, featured. You'll actually see that a lot of times. You can do that with Reader's Theater. You can do that with poetry. You can do that with um, any number of subjects or genre. And then click on STEAM. And then you use your filters to figure out what do I want. So there are over 3,000 books in this STEAM collection. And so now I choose my grade level. Like say I use my pre-K to two. And now I'm down to 1,000 books. And then I can say, well, which ones have a Reader's Theater script? So I click on that, and there are five pre-K to two that have a reader's theater script. Or I say, well, not that. I want to hear the author's voice. So how many of them are, have meet the author recordings? So now I have tick-tock, tick-tock. I froze. So now I have 90 books that have a meet the author recording. So the kids can literally have the author in the room at the moment they're reading the book. How fun is that? Um, and all those other awards, you can find them as well. You can either browse awards. So my browse is over here and I can browse awards. And not just STEAM, so I can choose my curricular area. So I can click STEAM and see STEAM awards, but I can go to math or I can go to history, I can go to science or social studies, and I can find award-winning books that I can buy from my library. Um, here's what it looks like in action. We also have these shelf talkers. So these QR codes, you can print these out and put them around your library. And kids can use their Chromebooks and scan it and they can hear the author. They can um, watch the book trailer. Um, you can feature an author and put the codes even inside the books. <clears throat> Just a reminder that you know that there is vetted content to support these books that we're talking about. You have Britannica English and Escolar, and you have seven products in ProQuest, which will give you more content for your STEAM. So make sure your teachers know that you have that. And um, go to the exhibit hall if you're not sure about that and talk to Ray, and Ray will make sure that you and your school are all set up for that, because he's here this weekend, so you can talk to Ray. But wait, there's more, because FactSight, bless her heart, Susan is so ill, she wasn't able to be here, and so FactSight is um, a, a very inexpensive, extra website 
um, where there are facts not just about science but other resources and you can contact them at owls at factsite.com they have primary and secondary information about science and other things and there is a conference special um, and so you can also enter to win a one-year FactSite subscription using this QR code. Um, so I'm going to add this to, it's in my presentation, which you have access to, and so you can scan that and con or just write um, al at factsite.com and ask about um, seeing that. So she apologizes for not being able to be here. So let me close with this better explanation of this book. Um, the phone booth in Mr. Hirota's garden. Books are powerful, you know that. Um, this story, The Phone Booth and Mr. Hirota's Garden, is a fictional story based on the truth. It's a story about, in 2011, um, a man um, was part of a tsunami that took almost everybody and everything in his village. And one of the things he lost, one of the people he lost was his cousin. And so um, this story is based on that story. It's a story about um, a little boy who loses his voice um, after a tsunami takes his family and takes all the things that he loves. And one day he hears a rat tat tat rrr, 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 next door. Mr. Hirota is building a phone booth in his garden. And every day Mr. Hirota goes out to uh, speak on a rotary phone and talk to his cousin he lost in the storm where his voice just goes out on the wind. And people hear about this phone booth in the garden and they line up to come and talk to their ancestors. And Mikao sees that. And one day he goes out to the phone booth and he picks up the phone. And he talks to the people that he misses. And he gets his voice back. And it's a wonderful story about science and about technology and weather. But it's based on a true story. And so your kids can read that story and go actually see Sasaki's phone booth that he built after the death of his cousin in 2011 and see that phone that people pick up every day to talk to the people that they miss. That's the power of books. That's the power of STEAM and asking questions and looking for answers every day. So let me thank you for all you do to bring science into your library, to bring technology, engineering, art, and math. I know it's a hard job, but I want you to remember how important it is. Even if you never see it yourself, someday you'll meet some kid in a grocery store somewhere, and he'll say, guess what I do now? Guess what I do? And you have a part in that. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for being here today. On your handout, did everyone get a handout? You'll see my contact information. Know that um, you can reach me at any time, deb at teachingbooks.net. Follow me on social media at LIB Deborah Ford. Um, that's my cell phone, 608-347-0398. Call me, text me. Um, I'm happy to help you. And um, this will be posted online. So you can click on those links and go right to that information. So thanks again. Have a great rest of your conference. Thanks for coming. So I wanted to tell you about two books I, I know about. One is called Perfect Pairs, Using Fiction and Nonfiction Picture Books to Teach Life Science. It's written by Melissa Stewart. Oh. Write Melissa Stewart's name on your paper, circle it, go to her website. She is the bomb of science. She's the author of the one about the seashells. And then I, I just got this book. 200 original and adapted story program activities. It has finger plays and poems, and a lot of them have science kind of tie-ins. So if you're looking for some new something to do in your library during your story times, these are good resources. So, um, Rob Reed, R-E-I-D. He also has some great read aloud books and tells you what part to read aloud. R-E-I-D, R-E-I-D, okay. Class dismissed.